I had no idea I was about to fall off the cart and get very, very sick. Uh, and now I'm at the point where I'm uh, uh, rather weak and uh, heavily medicated. Um, and I've been unable to stop coughing. But so if I, I'm using the handheld mic so I can throw it behind my back if needed. So if I go on a coughing jag, you just go until I stop and then everything will be all right uh, because I am going to finish uh, and normally of course I preach a message but I want to do something a little different today and I'm glad because this is a little more of teaching and it won't uh, it won't strain my voice or that sort of thing because if I start to preaching I think that's going to irritate my throat and then off I'll go so uh, if you leave here, if you never heard me preach today, please don't go out and put an assessment on Facebook of my preaching style because what you see today is not going to be exactly what those folks normally see each week. Uh, by the way, if you're going to comment, comment on the content, not on the style. All right? <laughs> A lot of people listen for style in preaching and in music when they ought to be listening for content. Right? And what that means is that sometimes they rejoice over style and they haven't had any substance, so it's not going to help them at all. And other times they miss the substance they needed because they didn't like the style. Uh, well, that was a free one. Let me tell you what a little story. Back on January 1, I'm, I'm praying. I try to take the first day of the year to uh, pray and think about the year and try to hear the Lord's voice. And we had just begun officially in December as your pastors. <coughs> we, um, you had, I told you that we were going to read through the Bible this year <clears throat> using the I daily, Our Daily Prayer Bible reading guide. So you, you read about three chapters of the Old Testament and anywhere from a half a chapter to a whole chapter in the New Testament. You read some of the Old, some of the New. You know, and the value of that plan is you don't die in Leviticus in the wilderness uh, in February uh, because you've got some New Testament each day. And on that day, the Lord prompted my heart after I read my readings for that day. I read a couple chapters of Genesis and part of the uh, first chapter of Matthew. And, uh, and he put it on my heart to attempt to write a 365-day devotional book for those who are reading through the Bible Old and New Testament and I said well Lord what am I going to do I'm going to take some aspect of one of these stories and uh, um, and and write what's going to make it distinctive uh, and what he put in my heart is that you find a common theme between the Old and New Testament reading for that day and you write on that and I said well how, how can I do that for 365 days? What, what am I going to do when I'm in the Sermon on the Mount and, and i got three chapters of skin diseases in, in Leviticus? What, what am I going to do? And I felt this little voice that just said, uh, I'll help you. And I said, well, okay. And I was highly dubious going in. Uh, but I made it through the first week. I made it through the first week, and I was starting to enjoy it, and I was posting them on our church Facebook page, which is called T-O-L-M Friends. You have to ask to be part of that, and I said, well, I'm going to try it out on these faithful people and see if they like it, and my conclusion was that one or two people liked it, and the rest apparently didn't read the page. But I said, Lord, do I keep doing this? And I kept doing it, and I made it a month. And then the funniest thing happened when I got to Leviticus. It got fun. I mean, it got fun. I, I was thinking, how in the world am I going to make it through February? Right? It's going to be easy when I get to the Psalms. But what am I going to do? It's going to be easy when I'm in Proverbs. Uh, it's probably going to be easy when I'm in Jeremiah and easy in Isaiah. What am I going to do? Well, I'm here to announce that it is the 30th of June, the, half, the end of the first half of 2019, and I made it this far. All right. Now, 
My goal is to finish this up and give the whole church a copy of a draft of it uh, to use next year. And you're going to give me your feedback, and then we will publish it after that. That's the idea. Now, you're all looking at me like, I'm not sure. What are we going to do here today? Well, what I decided to do was just take the last seven of these and force you to read them. <laughs> right? Well, isn't that how they get hooked, people hooked on stuff? They give them free stuff and keep on. Remember that first beer? Right? Wasn't that the nastiest thing you ever put in your mouth? Nobody can tell me they enjoyed their first drag off a cigarette. Right? Lonzo, you're looking at me funny. No, he didn't. He said, right? What happens is you got to get used to it, and you got to let that hook get in there. Now, I am not advocating drinking and smoking. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Let me say that to the camera. No drinking, no smoking, right? I did put a picture of a poster down at the checkered pig that I liked uh, because it had cows clogging on it. Right? It's in the men's restroom, ladies. Uh, and it was sponsored by Jack Daniels, so I put that on Facebook, uh, not on the church page. I put it on my page. And I said no to Jack Daniels, but yes to clogging cows. Uh, I, I would love to see that. But I'm not advocating drinking and smoking. All right? Uh, and if you've got a problem with that, I'd be glad to talk with you and help you pray with, <laughs> about that afterwards. Now, um, so I've given you a little explanation at the top. If, if you don't know about our daily bread, it's a daily devotional, um, and they're, they're good. Some, some of them are better than others, but it has a daily reading plan. We give these out. They're on the table. You can pick it up. They, they come out four times a year, and it just says, Today, Old Testament, read these chapters, New Testament, and it just goes straight through. Well, when we started on Monday... We were starting the book of Job. How many of you know you get really excited, especially when you're sick and not feeling well, to start into Job? <laughs> and we were already in the New Testament. We'd finished Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and now we were uh, about six or seven chapters into Acts. And if you know Acts, uh, six or seven, we're past Pentecost, and Peter's been preaching, and the church is growing, and they have... Uh, too many people to take care of and so they appoint the uh, the deacons and Stephen is one of those and they serve the widows and uh, in the midst of this though he preaches and he lays hand on the sick and demons are cast out and sick people are miraculously healed and he makes the church establishment or the Jewish establishment mad and they arrest him and then uh, he preaches and in his preaching, he makes them so mad, they kill him. Uh, and so maybe it makes sense if you can see a parallel between Job and Stephen. And so I wanted to share with you what I did on each day. Now, some of you who read this every day on the church Facebook page are aware with this. But let me just share it with you. And then I'm going to do something you've never seen done in church before at the end of the service, something I've never done. Um, and, uh, and, and well, I'll make you wait. Uh, I'll give little titles to these. For Monday, it was called Grudges. All right? Anybody ever carried a grudge? All right? All right? Uh, some of you are laughing happy. Some of you are laughing nervous. That means you're still carrying one. And our reading was, we read the first two chapters of Job, and then we read um, part of Stephen's testimony, the testimony that made him so mad they picked up rocks and pounded him. And here it is. Before Job's extraordinary trial, we learned that again and again he prayed, God, forgive my children for any secret sins or grudges that they may have against you deep in their hearts. And for this book, I'm using a new translation of the Bible called The Voice. So if it seems a little different. And I'd never seen that in Job before. It opens up 
with not with Job standing, uh, you know, not with the devil and, and God arguing about what they're going to do with Job. Uh, it opens with Job praying for his children. And apparently his children were heavy partiers. All right? And so Job is praying for his children. Lord, if they've got any grudges against you, any secret things in their heart, please, Lord, uh, I ask you to, uh, to forgive them. But by the end of the chapter, Job has lost everything, right? And he chooses to live out the very prayer he was praying for his children, refusing, quote, to make foolish charges against God. In other words, he lost it all. He lost his animals, he lost his wealth, his empire, he lost, he lost all his children, he lost all of his servants, in fact, the only thing he had left was his wife, and she didn't prove to be that helpful in the next chapter. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now, in this devotional, I jump to the New Testament reading. Stephen reminds us that Moses had multiple opportunities to hold grudges, see the key word, against the people God called him to deliver. Stephen tells us on at least two occasions where most of us would have said, Lord, I'm not putting up with those people anymore. But instead, though rejected by his own people, Stephen says, Moses indeed led our ancestors to freedom. All right? He could have quit several times because they, lit, as we would say today, they threw Moses under the bus on several occasions. So do you see how these little devotionals work? Right? Now, if you look on that Facebook page, uh, TLM and Friends, if you're reading through us in, per in particular, it should mean something. But even if you're not, you can have access to a fresh one of these every day. And I write one every single day, no matter what. I have written them in the comfort of my chair. I have written them in hospital waiting rooms. I have even... Uh, finish one at a stoplight. Don't tell anyone. It was it was red. I was I wasn't holding up traffic. I wrote I wrote an entire one on the treadmill at Planet Fitness. Now my thumbs are not that dexterous, and for me to write it on the treadmill, it took about an hour. I got a lot of exercise trying to write six sentences, but I got it done. Are you willing to look at another one with us? With us? Now, did that make sense to you about grudges? That it's a choice? Okay. On June 25th, I call this one the upward gaze. And it's the next two chapters of Job and the rest of the story of Stephen, the part where they kill him. All right? Well, he, he tells a Bible story, and he talks about how their ancestors were stiff-necked, and then he turned around and he said, like you. And then they picked up the rocks and he was dead. In both readings today, we see good men in torment. Early in Job's affliction, he looks down, wishing he had died young and was even now, quote, sleeping in peace. Lord, why didn't you kill me when I was a baby? Why didn't you kill me when I was a child? Why didn't you kill me when I was a teenager? Well, why don't you just kill me now? But in Stephen's agony, instead, he gazes, quote, upward into heaven. Even as the rocks are pelting him and they're aiming at his head. Seeing the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand. And then I encourage the reader, keep reading. Job will eventually learn to look up and see the Lord too. You know, sometimes we just got to look up. Psalm 5, 3 says that he is the glory and the lifter of my head. And sometimes, though, we can't get our heads up. We're so down. Have you ever been there? I've had one time in my life when I physically couldn't get my head up. My sugar had dropped. Gwen took it, and she said, it's 22 my head was on the kitchen table. She said, lift your head. I said, I can't. 
And so she runs to the refrigerator, gets some orange juice, which I don't really like. I should have told you. And she, she lifted my head and poured in some orange juice. All right? Uh, now, the Lord will lift your head, Steve, because if Psalm 5.3 says he's the glory and the lifter of my... Uh, it says, I will look up. In, in Psalm 3.3, 3, it says he's the glory and the lifter of my head. Let's go on to Wednesday. I call this one pain and the word. Pain and the word. Have you ever noticed that when you have an opportunity to speak up for Jesus or share something good that sometimes things aren't going so well? Or maybe you got a pain in your body. Maybe you'd much rather sit there and watch Pat and Vanna than to get on the phone or go out and see somebody and encourage them. Well, here it is. This is Job 5 to 7 and then Acts 8, which is the beginning of the story of, of um, um, well, of Philip. In the midst of Job's relentless agony, he finds comfort in one thing. He says in Job 6.10, I never denied the words of the Holy One in my pain. Now that's good to be able to say, I, in the midst of this circumstance, in the midst of my agony, in the midst of my misery, in the midst of my depression, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my torment, I never said anything bad about the Lord or about His Word. I've heard people say things, just uh, horrible things. The Lord doesn't love me. The Lord doesn't care. His Word doesn't work. I don't know why I bother to put my faith in it. But Job says, in the midst of my torment, I never said anything. But we see something even better in the life of uh, of about Saul. It says when Saul goes on a rampage following Stephen's death, hunting the church, it says that those who had been scattered by the persecution weren't afraid and they weren't silent. Instead, they spread the message of Jesus. And an example we have is Philip. In affliction, may we never deny the word of the Lord and may we always speak the word of the Lord. It's good not to deny the Lord, but it, the word of the Lord. It's even better in the midst of your agony to speak the word of the Lord. I'd, I'd take an amen on that one. I know it's not traditional preaching. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Brother Winford and I have an agreement, right, uh, that if Nobody's amening, he'll amen. And if and <laughs> that's our little agreement. All right. On uh, Thursday, a mediator. A mediator. We're reading Job. We read Job 8 through 10. And Acts, we finished Acts chapter 8, um, which is a story about one of my favorite stories about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I don't know what's going on. We've never had that problem before. It must, it must be whenever we have a problem, we say, well, then the devil must be afraid about what, of what's about to happen. Job responds to Bildad. If you weren't here on Tuesday, you don't know who Bildad is. I told them. He was the uh, shortest man in the Bible. Bildad the shoe height. Can y'all hear me back there? That was funny. <laughs> Bill Dad, the shoe height. He was even shorter than Nehemiah. Okay. Y'all are too serious today. Job responds to Bill Dad with perhaps the most important question ever asked. How can a person set things straight with God? Think about that. He sees the need for a quote, a judge to stand between us who can lay hands on both of us. Centuries later, the Holy Spirit leads Philip to a wealthy Ethiopian eunuch searching for such a mediator 
in the words of Isaiah. Philip uses the passage to explain the good news of Jesus. People are still looking to set things straight with God. Are we ready to meet them where they are and point them to Jesus? I particularly enjoyed writing this one because you see, you see this, and in, in, in it's so interesting. You just happen to be reading in the old and happen to be reading this in the new, the way it lined up. <coughs> and there is, there is Job going, oh, I need a mediator between God and me. And then you find this story of how the, the Lord just uh, uh, sends Philip out into the middle of the desert. Right? And there, he doesn't expect to meet anyone, and he meets this guy who just doesn't, he's not your everyday guy. First of all, he's an African. Second, he is rich. <laughs> he is the treasurer of the richest nation in Africa, Ethiopia. Right? Third thing about him is he's a eunuch. Right? And so this is a different kind of guy. And so Philip is out there, and when he goes by him, he hears him. He's, he's re either he's letting his animals pull the chariot themselves, or he has his own driver. And he is reading aloud from a scroll that he had gone to Jerusalem and bought. He's reading in Isaiah 53 about the promise of a mediator. <coughs> And Philip comes up to him, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, no, I was hoping to find somebody to help me. He had been to the religious center of J Jerusalem, didn't find his help, and was going home without hope. And the Holy Spirit sent Philip there. And Philip said, I love the King James. Beginning at that point, he, he spoke to him about Jesus. You know, whatever a person's problem is, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you can, you can start them at that point. Don't tell them about your problems and your surgeries and your this and your that. Don't tell them about your preacher. Don't tell them about your church. You tell them, take them to Jesus. Just take them right to Jesus. He's the one that fixed your mess, and he's the only one that can fix theirs. Are you, are you up for a little bit more? And then the surprise. Well, here is one. Surprising people. Um, I'm not going to use that word prejudice, but sometimes we predetermine what we expect out of people based on who they are and what they look like. Right? And we expect to get help from certain people and, and no help from other people. Well, the Bible is very good at kind of surprising us from time to time. And so this is based on Job 11 to 13 and Acts chapter 9. And that's when we're introduced to Saul becoming a Christian and eventually be, being named Paul. Now, uh, before I do this, you know, the middle verse of the Bible is Psalm 118.8 says, Better trust in the Lord than put your confidence in a man, in people. And I'm so glad Job didn't put his confidence in his, quote, friends. All right? Uh, I hope you don't have any friends like, the, like Job's friends. All right? And, and what was the problem with them? Everything was Job's fault. Well, Job, you don't understand. This is the way I see the world, so I don't know. There's no evidence of it, but clearly you're doing this. And that's why you're going through problems. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to make it. That would have been a good time to do this. All right. We tend to expect trustworthy advice and sound wisdom from our friends and the opposite from our enemies. But Job's friends let him down. You smear me with lies as if to help, he tells them. But as healers, you are worthless. You know, there are times we really ought to tell some people who keep putting their nose up in our business, your advice is worthless. I've, every time I've listened to you, it's cost me. 
and I love you and I appreciate you, but don't give me any advice anymore, and if you do, I'm not going to listen to it. All right? I don't care whether it's Oprah, Dr. Phil, or your cousin, or your barber, or your bar... Well, I guess you wouldn't have one of those. Now, if I go too far, just say, it's the medicine. Just say, it's the medicine. It's not the pastor. He wouldn't have said bartender in church. All right. And the Lord tells Ananias to trust Saul, a self-professed enemy of Christ's followers. He's an evil man, Ananias says to the Lord. In fact, he goes on, he's explaining to the Lord as if he didn't know him. <laughs> he says, but you don't understand. <coughs> All right. But the Lord explains, I have chosen him to be my instrument to bring my name far and wide. People can surprise us one way or the other. The next one may be my favorite, assassins. I've never preached on assassination before, but I surely enjoyed writing this yesterday morning. In Acts 9, Saul goes from wanting, quote, to kill every one of the Lord's disciples to escaping a plot to assassinate him for making, quote, an irrefutable case that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, God's anointed. Sometimes the assassination of one's character is harder to escape than actual efforts to take one's life. All right? I don't know if anyone's ever tried to kill you, right? I had one person say he went somewhere to kill me and I wasn't there and I was thankful I, I wasn't there. I'm not sure he was telling the truth. Um, but uh, he did go to jail. Uh, he wasn't a church member. It, this was back before, back in the day, okay? Uh, don't want to alarm you. Um, uh, but I have had people attempt to assassinate my character. And that has happened in church. <laughs> and it's probably happened to people in every church you've ever been a part of. And in some ways, I mind that a whole lot more than sneaking around wanting to shoot me. I figure the Holy Spirit's going to protect me there. All right? Now, Job finds this out as Eliphaz begins his second round of speculation on Job's faults. In Job 16.3, we read his response to them. Have we, reached, have we reached the end of your windy words, or are you sick with something that compels you to argue with me? May the Lord protect us from the sickness that compels the destruction of others. There are people in their sinfulness or just in their misery who feel compelled to destroy other people's joy, to destroy their happiness, right? If I can't have it, you can't have it either. And then for today, fresh out of the oven, here is this devotional, Just in Time. Have you ever been in a perplexing situation? where it was, what do we say today? It's complicated, which means I don't know what to do, <laughs> right? If I do this, this, if I do that, I, I just don't know. In perplexing situations, we have hope that the Lord will provide enough insight to help us make sound decisions. When Peter is in, um, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter is confused and unsettled by reoccurring vision. Quote, the voice of the Holy Spirit broke through his churning thoughts. Have you ever had churning thoughts? When your mind's just going 100 miles an hour and you can't sleep and you, you, I could do this, I could do this, I could do that, but you don't know what to do. And God's his meeting with the Roman centurion Cornelius. In other words, he, Peter made the decision to give full and equal admission to Gentiles who followed Jesus. You didn't have to be a Jew. I mean, thank God, or a lot of us will be in trouble. 
And when Job can find no answer to explain his pain or satisfy his persecutors, he just suddenly, in Job 19, gives voice to a singular hope that rises up inside of him. And to me, this is my favorite verse in all of, in all of Job. In the midst of his pain, the midst of his misery, sitting there, couldn't walk, couldn't get comfortable, boils all over his body, three friends who wouldn't shut up, who'd been talking for three weeks, right? In the midst of that, he just says, I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will rise and take his stand on the earth, and though my skin has been stripped off, still in my flesh, I will see God. In other words, I'm going to make it through this. The Lord's going to take care of me. The Lord's going to vindicate me. I have a Redeemer, and I'm going to live forever, no matter how miserable it appears right now. Now, I've shared these seven devotionals, and, and I'll be very candid. I'm hoping to try to spark your interest in reading these either daily or occasionally. And to do that, you just uh, ask to join that group. It's free, and you can follow. Another thing I'm hoping to do is, is to try to resource those of you who are reading your Bible through to help you see through that reading of the Bible. Uh, look, what can I get out of it? All right? How do I apply it? Because reading your Bible through can become a rote activity that's deader than a doornail if you're not careful. The third object I had here was if you're not reading your Bible through, uh, I want to encourage you to jump in and start. And if nothing else, just start reading the New Testament with us and read that chapter or half a chapter a day. It will give you great strength.